Welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Danielle Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast, where we bring you conversations of high value, high inspiration to help you along your entrepreneurial journey to build a brand foundation that is super strong and can withstand the test of time as you continue to grow as a brand and as a business owner in both your personal life and your professional life. Today, we are talking to Erin Alula, a CEO, website copywriter, and copywriting coach. Okay, if you have been with me on this podcast journey, in my social media journey, or at any point in my journey, you know that my description of branding, I will give you the short version, is that branding goes way beyond the visuals that we see. It goes way beyond your logo. It goes way beyond the colors that we see. It involves this life that really makes up the DNA of your business. So that includes very strong copy and copy that I could read without seeing anything else. And I should be able to gauge that this is coming from you. This is coming from you as a business owner and you as the person. I should be able to know that the way you write certain captions, the way you write your email marketing, the gifts that you add in, the one-liners that you add in, the um, throwbacks that you add in, the relations you add into uh, TV shows that you have talked about in the past. I should be able to tell that this is you as the business owner behind this copy. So that's why I'm very excited to jump into this episode with Erin, conversion copywriter, copywriting coach, wordslinger, or wing woman, no matter what you call her, Erin Alula's job is to step in and show the world just how incredible her clients truly are. With over 15 years of publishing experience and an MFA in creative writing, she gets what it takes to idea, to take idea, create, and implement smart SEO website copy and strategic content campaigns. When Erin's not cheering on creatives and service-based entrepreneurs or hosting the Talk Copy to Me podcast, she you can catch her indulging in ice cream and spending time with her family in Southeastern MA. I forgot to ask her what flavor of ice cream. Maybe I did, but I definitely had it on my questions. Uh, anyway, without further ado, let's jump into this episode. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you guys. Before we press record, we were both like, hey, I saw you did this. I saw you did that. Oh, you're from Massachusetts. I was just in Cape Cod. So <laughs> we did a whole, we were saying that sometimes you schedule these things so far in advance, so you kind of forget who you're talking to. So it was nice to be surprised with Aaron, <laughs> Aaron this morning. Um, yes. But I always like to start these podcasts off by just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about what you do and your journey thus far. Oh, perfect. I can do that. Um, my name is Erin Olilla, and I am an SEO website copywriter. Um, the way that I got to this point is a little windy road in, in a very straight windy road, if that makes any sense. Um, I thought that I would be teaching writing at college. So I got my bachelor's first in um, creative writing and in what they used to call public and professional communications, which is really a lot like marketing, but how we speak in the marketing world. Um, after that, I worked for a little while. I went and got my MFA in creative writing again from Fairfield University. Um, and that was, you know, it's a terminal degree. So that was kind of the, the, the launch to be able to teach in college. And I did a little. Um, through that experience, I started my own literary journal with a colleague from school. It's still running. It's uh, our 10 year anniversary this year. Uh, we've won awards for it, which has been lovely. So the real true start of my writing career was all in creative writing. Um, for me, I focused in creative nonfiction, but there's always been this element that's missing when it came to writing for me. Uh, a lot of that being psychological as well as mm. I say marketing because it's easy to understand. But what I mean is like, what makes people tick? You know, in a bio that I had, what feels like a bajillion years ago, I called myself an emotional archaeologist because I really like to like, you know, when I meet people like deep down dives with them, like discover who they are. I'm not so much a surface level chatter. Right? So um, 
when I began to write some content, that was one of my first um, writing traditional jobs out of my MFA. It was for a lovely company that wrote SEO blog content for about medium sized businesses. I just loved it. Um, I loved that I was able to use that like interest in like what makes people buy, what motivates them in order to share good content, like informational content with them. And that was my first entry into SEO. And it's been like eight or nine years now. But what I loved about SEO is like I could gamify it, like I could um, Mm -hmm. fight against myself for better results. So I just felt like I was like constantly tweaking and testing and learning. Uh, Once I left that job to start my own business, I've pretty much done the same. I've worked in copy and content. And what I specialize in marketing for, um, excuse me, website marketing for the main part of my business, it's because I feel like it's a very underlooked part of how we sell ourselves. You know, there's so much uh, information on how to write sales pages, on how to um, show up on social media. But what about that foundational like home that we have, it gets neglected so often. So that's the long story of Erin being a young adult into like a little older adult. Um, And the mix of how I, I really lived in the creative world as well as the copywriting world. I love that. And I love that you have such a a different perspective of, of copy and words and attaching it to the psychology of it all. When I got into brand design, I loved, fell in love with the psychology behind fonts specifically yeah. and colors and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like it goes hand in hand, but I never really, I was never a word lover ever. And then I got into college where you're allowed to write about things that you actually like, like, yes. <laughs> and yep. I took a huge TV production track and I was analyzing frame by frame, my favorite TV shows. You got to pick every, anything you wanted. So that was when I really discovered like the power of words, right. And the psychology yeah. behind that, but I never really studied that specifically. So I, I definitely want to dive into that, but before we jump into understanding the love of words and the power behind them for websites and marketing and all of that, tell us about this lit- literary journey a journal <laughs> that you started and what it, what is it, where can we find it? And how did you get that going? Sure. Um, It's called Spry Literary Journal. Uh, Myself and one of the the cohort-based people that I was in graduate school with, her name's Lindsay Jane. Um, What happened is, I kind of think it's a funny story, but it was right before we graduated. At the time, we were both um, genre editors for our school's literary journal. Um, So she was a poetry editor. I was a nonfiction editor. And we were using Google chat at work, like, you know, our traditional jobs that were not writing related. And we were like, well, what are we going to do? Like, this is weird. Now we're just going to graduate and go back to like our administrative type jobs. This doesn't seem right. So that's how it got conceived. We were literally like, oh, yeah, we could just do this on our own, which is so silly from the amount of work that actually goes into it. But let me tell you, like, if there's anything I've learned about myself, it's sometimes like when I don't think about how much work that goes into things when I just believe in an idea, it turns out so well, you know, like, as business owners, I think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make sure things turn out well, you know, like branding in general, like, does this match that like, am I showing up the right way here that I'd show up there? But sometimes it's as simple as like having a belief. Um, So I'll just get into the basics. You know, that's the that's the story when we just were two young girls who wanted to do something still with writing. We launched shortly after launching. um, We launched as a complete volunteer journal. So the websites, the um, the graphic design, the 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 fees to be able to read people's submission all came out of our own pocket. And it still has all come out of our own pocket. Um, We're not affiliated with any universities, which is very important to us because we truly wanted to make the decisions ourselves on what we would publish. And the other thing that's important about Spry is that it is a completely concealed journal. Um, Most people are familiar with the term non-blind. We're trying to get a little bit more inclusive and not use words like that. So for us, we only read what would be concealed submissions that do not have anyone's name or identifying information within the piece. Uh, We automatically reject things where people say, you know, hi, it's Jocelyn, and I really want to um, show you this story that I've written about whatever, Um, just because it's not fair to all of our volunteer readers who, you know, cull through these submissions, we probably get about a thousand submissions a month, sometimes less, sometimes more. Yep. 
we've published, I think we're just about to publish issue 14. I know that sounds silly, but at this point, I'm like, what, which issue is it? 13, 14, 15? Um, that should be up actually within the next week or so. Um, but we have published everyone from their very first publication of their life to people who have um, 13 books. You know, they've been college professors, really well known in their industry. And I just think there's something beautiful about the fact that we did not know who we were publishing. So there was no, you know, handpicking people with bigger audiences, giving people a fair chance. And one of the most rewarding things for me is those people who we published for the very first time that gave them their first, you know, glimpse of being what it's like to be an author have gone on to write their own chapbooks, been published in larger um, publishing companies. And I just think that's a lovely, lovely thing I would have never gotten to do if we didn't just take that little chance. Yeah, I love that. And I can't believe it's been 10 years of you being yeah. able to maintain um, and keeping it kind of just just you guys. I think that's really amazing. We'll definitely put that down in the show notes for anybody to to check out. Okay, so now tell us exactly how you work with your current clients or what your current services are. Yeah, sure. So um, most of my clients come to me for websites. That's the face value of my business. But then they don't leave after they've come to me. So that does not mean that I work with clients in all ways. There are things I enjoy doing and things I don't. And I will never take on a project where I don't feel excited about it or I don't feel like I have the particular skills because there are so many lovely copywriters that I know that I will share work with. They'll share work with me. So I feel like when my clients come into my my little funnel, let's say, the Aaron's world of working with me, um, they come because they know that they either want more visibility, they want to feel more confident about their overall brand, or they want, um, a lot of what I hear is, my competitor's website is just so nice. They say things so well, and I'm embarrassed to give my website out to people. You know, what do I do to fix it? And a lot of what we'll find is, you know, it wasn't strategic to start with. So they'll come to me for those reasons. I care very strongly for SEO because I feel in, in the grand scheme of things, like why put things out there if you're not allowing people outside of your network to find you. You know, your business will only grow so much if you're only dealing with local people in your network or people in your small little online digital pond, I'd like to say. So when I work with my clients, we'll develop, you know, what what's the strategic approach to this? How are we moving people through the pages? Um, in addition to SEO, client experience is also a vital role in what and how things work when it comes to the website. So some of the questions we'll ask is like, what's the goal? How are we moving people toward that goal? Do you have multiple goals like purchase this um, something in a shop versus let's get on a discovery call? So they come in, they get the website. And then when we're done working together, a lot of my clients will stay on for small retainers like SEO work, if they're going to work on building out content, um, or it, whether it be something like true content, email marketing, things like that. Uh, but for the most part, it's those websites that people can really understand the value in getting that, you know, what, what, however you'd like to call it, digital storefront, resume-like uh, website, mm -hmm. uh, anything that really shows their business up to a standard that they're comfortable with. And I have had a few people who consider themselves SEO experts, but I feel like just like a brand expert, I want to ask this to everyone sure. of how, how does SEO really work? Can you break yeah. that down for anybody who really just doesn't understand what it is? Absolutely. And I think SEO is one of the most misunderstood slash easiest things. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot. So people tend to get overwhelmed when they, when they hear those three letters, the very basics is SEO stands for search engine optimization. And what that means for the end users like me, the copywriter, or someone who's doing it themselves as the business owner, is that the words that we choose to put into our copy or content are um, strategic. So let's just say, as an example, someone who's a landscaper, and that would be a local job, right? So like you're not, for the most part, you're not going to be landscaping all over the country. In that instance, an SEO keyword for that person may be Massachusetts landscaping, or maybe they focus on things like trees, you know, like Massachusetts landscaping and tree removal. 
They could even cull that down further to the area uh, that Norwood, Massachusetts landscaping. So by those keyword phrases, which as you know, if I haven't stated that clearly, let's throw some quotes, quote, Norwood, Massachusetts landscaping, end quote, that phrase itself is an indicator to um, what I like to call the robots of Google um, to mm. that scan our text and scan our websites to say, hey, this website is about landscaping. And when we indicate that to Google or any of the search engines, just using Google as an example, they then share that content in a strategic way for the end users who are searching for things. You know, so myself as a consumer, if I go into, you know, a Google um the little bar where you can write what it is that you are looking for. And I type in like landscaper near me because that person in this imaginary example has used that keyword phrase. If I were local to Norwood, Google would show that to me because Google knows the location that I am as the, as the consumer. So without going too far into details, cause I'm trying to undercomplicate this for everyone. SEO is using keywords and keyword phrases to stand out in the search engine results. So the right people who are actively looking for the, either the answers to those questions or maybe looking for a particular solution can find you and your website in comparison to someone else's site. Got it. Clear, concise, and simple. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And when we're inserting these keywords or we, we developed our list of keywords, where should we be putting these inside our website? Yeah, super good question. Um, so um, I like to break them down by posts and pages because they will follow a very similar trajectory, but there's a little bit different approach because the pages of your website and as example, those might be your home page, your about page, services pages, or any of those main standard pages that fall in your navigation bar. For the most part, you have less words that you're using on those pages. But in, um, and I say that because whereas post, things like blog post, case studies, show notes, you have a more of an opportunity to write longer things, which allows you to kind of keep using those keyword phrases or synonyms of those keyword phrases more and more often. But let's just jump back to the pages for an example. One thing you're gonna want to do is you'll want to make sure it's in the URL slug. And I know that sounds complicated, but that just means that it's at the end of the URL. So mm -hmm. in my instance, um, copy coaching for one of my services would be erinolilla.com backslash copy dash coaching. So that's a keyword that I'm actively using. Now, I've put it in that keyword, the URL slug. I've also have it for the title of my page. I'm using it in the meta description. And if you're not familiar with a meta description, that's that little blurb that Google shows you when you do search for something. Um, so if you're using a plugin or a tool, one of the free and popular ones is Yoast. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're using something like that, you can write your own meta descriptions. Google sometimes likes to play around and decide that they're going to not acknowledge that and write their own meta descriptions for things, but that's fine. It's really just a way to, to show people the intent of the page that they're going to land on. In addition to those things, you're going to want to use it on the page itself, right? Like you wouldn't put all this effort to be strategic with keywords and then not use them within the page's website copy. And I always tell people, you know, this isn't the 2010s of SEO. Use these words naturally. Do not try to stuff them everywhere throughout the page. That's not going to do anything good for yeah. you. Google's so much smarter in the past like 10, 15 years. What we just want to do is we want to use them as step one, but we want our entire site to work together. So for example, if I have, you know, my top pages being things like, website copy, website copywriter, and then all of my blog posts are about things like, you know, the best swimsuits for 2022, or like how to bake banana bread, you know, how to make a margarita, like that doesn't say anything about copywriting, it confuses the search engines. So when we're just writing good copy or content, writing it naturally, so we're using these words and similar words in a way that our reader understands that's a key indicator for the search engines that it's all interrelated. And it's also 
easier for the reader to like build that connection and be mm-hmm. like, oh, wow, I really like this person. I like what they have to say. I trust them. I'm going to be like willing to reach out for a discovery call or, or purchase their product. Um, quickly, because I know I've used this phrase a few times and I haven't really explained it. When I say things like keyword synonyms, what I mean are like words or phrases that are so close to the one that we're indicating as our main keyword for the page. Um, so copy coach, as an example, um, because I use that, I would also write copywriting coach or coach for writing copy, things like that. Because if every sentence just says copy coaching, copy coaching, copy coaching, nobody's going to want to read that. But when I'm using those similar phrases, it's still that indicator to the you know big old search engines that I'm talking yeah. about the same relevant thing. And it reads so much more naturally. And is there a, a site? I know like there's specific Etsy, um, SEO searching, stuff like that, where you could go and type mm-hmm. in one word and a bunch of phrases or other words pop up. Is there something similar for just general SEO that you could use? Is that what Yoast is? Yes. Uh, well, no, Yoast is like a plugin that we'll use on the back end of a WordPress site. And it gives okay. you the fill in the blanks to say like, yes, this is what I want my title to be. Um, what it's doing is kind of like helping you out as the writer to make sure you're following best practices. But Yoast in itself is doing nothing to better your website for SEO. Okay. It's just kind of like that checklist to say, oh, yeah, you did it right. You did this right. Ooh, you're forgetting that. Um, But when you mention tools, absolutely. There are so many tools that people can use to find keywords. Um, The easiest tool is literally the Google search bar. Um, Type in a phrase that's similar, you know, maybe again, using the landscaping example. If you if you want to start doing local keywords, type in the name of the town and landscaping and it will auto populate with similar keyword phrases. They might not all be good, but there some of them are great. Um, Another tool that's very cheap for keywords is Keywords Everywhere. It's a Chrome extension and it allows um, a bit of a keyword search to come up whenever you're searching anything. But there are other tools. Answer the Public was a really good tool. I mean, it is still, but it was just taken over by Ubersuggest. Um, So it still can be free, especially if you're using the free version of Ubersuggest, but Ubersuggest is a relatively cheap uh, lifetime purchase. And that can give you a ton of great SEO information about your own site. And then there's some of the bigger ones that um, more of the SEO people who are, you know, investing in the the information, the data that they're gathering would use, such as SEM Rush, um, Moz, and things like that. Love it. And so let's go circle back to like the psychology of words and stuff like that. You have something um, that I read that you put out talks about SEO focused sentences or strategic and SEO focused sentences. So we've talked a lot about the keywords, a lot about SEO, but how do we make these sentences or are there other, anything that you didn't cover yet to make sure that sentences that we are producing are kind of all in line with our mission to just increase our brand awareness, but making sure that we're doing it in a way that is authentic to ourselves and makes Google happy. (laughs) Yeah, no, that is such a good question. And I think, I mean, if there can be any instruction in here, it's do what you just said at the end, you know, like be true to yourself, your own business, your own brand, Uh, speak in a way that is familiar for you, that's your own, you know, voice and tone, and then use the words and phrases that you would be using, you know, it'd be really weird if on that, um, like a website, someone spoke in an extremely professional or maybe educational tone. If what they did was like fitness training or something Mm -hmm. that just, it just didn't jive with who they were as a person or what their business was, but there is an answer to that. So it's knowing two things before doing any research. One, what is the main goal that I have for this site or this page? And sometimes, you know, a site has a goal, but each page has its very own goals. So first, no matter what, determine what that goal is. Secondly, I think we have to think before we start typing things into those, you know, Google search bars or any of these SEO tools, what's the intent of the of the message that I'm trying to share? I think this is what where I get so frustrated when I when I read other SEO strategists and their what they're sharing sometimes. Data is so valuable. But if you write a website that you're not considering intent when it comes to what you're sharing, someone could find your page, you know, find your website on page one of Google, 
click over to it. And if they're like, oh, wait, this isn't what I thought it was, they're going to bounce right away. When that keeps happening over and over and over and over again, Google's going to like bring you down SEO wise. And that's an oversimplification of how it happens. But the point is we want our, what this, the strategy part of that sentence that you shared is, is mixing the goal of what you're trying to do with the site with how people are going to come in, how you're answering their questions. Um, so silly question again, if it was how to bake banana bread, which is one of those things I mentioned, if the title of the post is how to bake banana bread, that's also the keyword phrase. The meta description that they see when they're Googling that question is, you know, something like, have you ever wondered how to bake banana bread? This post will tell you X, Y, Z. Let's say they then click over to the page and instead of an actual recipe with instructions, it talks about like um, this person's wish that they learned how to bake banana bread. Zero instructions, zero ingredients, and it ends with like, I just went to the store and bought banana bread myself. Can you see how the intent does not match with the keyword phrase that yeah. you're using? You know, it's a disappointment. And whether or not you get an automatic bounce or you just have disappointed people, I think that's the worst part. Why would you ever want disappointed people on your mm -hmm. website? It's not going to help you. So the best way to answer your question is that knowing your goals and then making sure whatever your intent aligns with the intent when you write those sentences of the people who are going to read them. Got it. I feel like that was super helpful. And now I'm wondering if, so I feel like there's a lot of people who listen to this, who are either just starting their business or they're just kind of experimenting with their website or they're in that in-between if they're ready to do a rebrand and they're kind of like in the teenage years of their entrepreneurial journey, ready to become that adult and they feel like they need to revamp some things in their branding, but definitely their website. So to speak to the first people, I find they always get nervous about the need for testimonials on a website. So yeah, I mean, back when I was starting, I asked a friend who I did free work for to write me something. I basically write it for her and she just like, yep, it's good. So <laughs> how important are testimonials when we're just starting out? And then what role can they play as we continue growing our businesses? Yes, yeah, such a valuable question. Um, the answer is testimonials are always very important. I just it launched a course recently about testimonials. And in my research, there was a data point, which I think was from Edelman Research. I don't want to misquote it, but it was pretty much the effect of 98% of consumers will search for social proof, which be it product reviews or testimonials before even like making a decision about that site that they're looking for. You know, so whether it's Target and you're searching for like um, new bedding and you go right to the reviews before you even start to scan through like the different types of sheets, let's say, or whether it's a small business that is just getting started and they just scroll through that homepage or maybe the services page and just see, is there, does anyone have anything to say about this? So it's vital. But the answer that I will say to any new business owner is don't worry about all of these things. And I don't, I don't mean to make a joke of this, but I mean it seriously. Like you can get so held back on business when you are just desperate to follow the rules of online business. And there are no stinking rules here. Like you want to start a business, get a Google document type out some thoughts, share it to someone who could be a potential customer and go with it. Like that's your sales page. That's your website. Yeah. It is as simple as that to get started. Um, but if you're looking for an actual answer to that, I think it can be as simple as doing some work for free, which I hate to advise because I'm really an advocate for getting paid for your hard work, um, doing work through agencies that might be able to help you get that initial start and always asking for the testimonial as you do the work. Okay. So always kind of have the testimonials is, or always ask for them. Do you have a process that feels not icky to ask for the Wait. testimonial? Yeah. Now this is my favorite question to answer. Um, the easiest way to do this is to be a good listener. And I know that mm -hmm. sounds silly, but I have gotten the most wonderful testimonials from just paying attention to what my clients have said to me whether it's what they say in an email, you know, like maybe they respond to a question I ask them and they say like, oh, I'm so grateful that you took the time to really like dive into this. I didn't think this is something you'd be doing. Or whether we're on um, a call and they say like, that's a great idea. Can you, can you say more? Like those things I try to keep a log of, it seems 
like a silly thing to do to keep a log of your client conversations. But I think that's where you're able to get the best um, individual testimonials. And what I mean by that is instead of just saying like, Aaron is great, Aaron is a good copywriter, you get those in this instance, this happened or um, anything that's customized to the project that could potentially work really well on a specific page. So, you know, your services page, if there's just one standard services page, let's pretend it's for a VA who focuses on podcast, right? Um, if you have a testimonial that speaks to how that VA, you know, is integral to the podcast process and really makes the editing so easy so that person can focus more on content, whatever it is, that's a great one to use on that page because it's specific to the exact offer that they have. And this is where I think, you know, people wish they had better testimonials, but they don't know how to get that. It's because they want something specific and they're asking general questions. So tip one is just simple. It's listen. Tip two is to develop a process throughout the entire project, which means when you first start working with people, you ask them questions related to testimonials. Those could be something to the effect of like, you know, for a very general one, like what led you to work with me? Like, what are you struggling with at this point? So that when you get to the end of the project, when you're actually asking testimonial specific things, you can say to them, when we first started working together, you were worried about, let's pretend it's lack of visibility and, um, you know, being lost in a sea of your competitors. Now that this project is over, do you feel like anything has changed with this specific problem you are having? Because mm, they're going to answer that so smart, with yeah. the like exact answer. They're not just going to say, Aaron is good, right? They're going to yeah. say, actually, yeah. Can you believe that in this like just two weeks since we launched the site, I've gotten, you know, four discovery calls or I've been on two podcasts that pitched me, whatever mm. it is you're giving them the opportunity to share specifics with you. I love that. That's genius. I'm going to use that for sure for myself. Do it. I've never really felt super icky asking for them, I guess, because I've, I've worked with a couple of clients over and over and over again, but it is still a tinge of uncomfortable. Like, you know, they're not going to say no, but right. they couldn't give you like the best one ever. Um, so that method definitely, definitely will come in handy. So one last kind of question that wraps up the SEO website conversation really just is, is there anything else that you feel we really, really need to know or a classic mistake that you see people doing on their websites that we definitely should avoid? Um, I think maybe an easy one is not, is, is thinking of a website as like a statue, right? Like that never mm. changes. Like you put in all of the time investment, the financial investment to get it to where you want to be and you can leave it there and just let it live on its own. That's the worst thing I think anyone could do with a website. And when I, throughout my projects, I should say, I really try to encourage my clients to know that when this project is over, like your wishes and dreams don't magically appear, right? Like you have to continuously put in work and that work doesn't have to be hard. It could be as simple as making sure you have your Google Analytics set up so you do see if that SEO work like that you've put in is working. Um, I'm an SEO strategist. I've done this for a very, very long time before SEO was even anything popular or this online business world existed. But I still have to test and try things. Sometimes it's, it's more important to have like an SEO keyword phrase with a smaller amount of monthly searches if it is the ideal deal like client phrase. So those things you just test and tweak over time. I'm not suggesting you rewrite your website every six months, every year. You don't want to do that, but you just want to kind of keep an eye on the pulse of your website to maybe every year read your pages. Do they still make mm -hmm. sense to what you're offering? Do they speak to the right person? Are you oversharing? Are you undersharing? Like, so I guess maybe setting up a process to audit your website every year would be a very helpful advice. And one quick thing, just because it popped in my head and it relates to this question and the last one, you asked me about that phase two, like the business teenagers. I think something that's really great that people who have already started asking for testimonials and getting them and really want to up that social proof factor for their sites that they can do is to create storified case studies based on the testimonials. So let's say you're interviewing a client about what the project was like to gain feedback on how you can better your own business, as well as to get that testimonial, turn that like that conversation itself into a case study. 
And, you know, you don't have to get nervous about case study as content, especially if we're talking to those like the toddlers of online business here too. It could be as simple as here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's the end of the project. Yeah. And what you do is you show the need in the beginning, you talk about the process in the middle, and the end is if there are any wins. And don't look down on the tiny wins. The tiny wins could very well be giving your client more ease in their life. It could very well be building their confidence. It could be taking over tasks that were overwhelming them. That's great for a case study. And I know you said a lot of your clients you work with on a longer term basis, just remember your case studies can be updated. Like, again, mm -hmm. it's not a statue. So maybe you write that three paragraph case study to start when you first working with a client. And then at that six month or the year, year mark, you say, let's review that case study. You look at it and you realize, oh, there's been a couple other wins I can add in here. Or they've said something very specific that would be like an addition to the testimonial. Update it. It's going to just yeah. serve you even better. I love that. Yeah, it is. It's kind of like a living, breathing document that just as you grow up as an entrepreneur, so does your website. And yes. I love seeing them kind of grow up with, with you and showing your new services, showing your new wins and showing those new case studies and client journeys that you've gone through with your own clients. Super valuable. Thank you for all of that information. So leading to my last question is something that I ask all of my guests and it is to define a time in your life or in your business where you're living what we call off brand or not in alignment, not authentic to yourself. And I don't even like using those words anymore. I feel like they're so just cliche now, but they really do hold such true meaning of authentic and alignment. And how did you recognize that you weren't living in that on your own path? And how did you navigate back to that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I something came to my mind automatically, and I think it's probably the most relevant to talk about. Um, when I first, actually, before I first started my own business, I was um, working part time for the my former company that I was um, a editorial manager for and freelancing part-time. And the the only way I could really manage the caseload of my clients through my traditional job and my clients through um, freelancing was to keep um, a structured weekly goal list. So I'd name out the clients, I'd write the goals down, and I knew what I have to do every week. Well, the beautiful thing at that time was I would always write my own name as a client and treat my business mm. like a client. Um, and I would say it's not like one particular moment that's off brand, but I found that cyclically throughout my business, I've in August will be um, six years for me in business. So I, I'm reiterating this not to embarrass myself, but I'm reiterating this to just show that, yes, I've done this for a long time. I have wonderful, huge wins in my business in six years, but cyclically, I fall back into this trap of not treating my business like I would treat a client. And I see it through my peers, my friends. It is the worst thing I think business owners can do. Um, and what I mean by that, just in case you're listening and you're like, I don't know what Erin means. And this isn't exactly relative for all businesses, but in the marketing world or the wider online business world, we can look at our business as a marketing client. So what do I have to do for visibility? What do I have to do to market myself in an informational way when it comes to like things like SEO and attracting those people outside of our networks? Um, there's a money question that you can ask here, but basically that's how we treat our business like a client. We put aside time every single week to work on those client goals. The, for me, it would be those Erin Olilla business goals. Um, I find that when business gets busy, I always fall off of that, you know, goal planning. And you asked how I recognize that. I think it just creeps up on you. You know, totally. you notice it when the client, like the new client inquiries dip a little. You notice it when, you know, you're not posting on social for a while and someone says like, oh my gosh, I haven't like seen of you in so yeah. long. Or you do post a win and someone's like, oh my gosh, look at that. You did this big thing and you have to look at yourself and say, well, I have actually been doing big things for the for this whole time and no one knows because right. I'm not doing a good job to make that clear. Um, so coming back from that is really just knowing this is one of the big tenants of running my own business to treat myself like a client, to discipline myself and to kind of like not punish myself because I really don't do that. But like to say like there are repercussions to this, you know, it could be as easy to see as a financial repercussion 
or the tiny things like, you know, website traffic down, uh, like I said, um, leads being less frequent. So it's just kind of staying on the pulse of my own business here too, to say like, are you doing the work you want to do? Are you being fair to your own business? Um, and asking that pretty frequently throughout the, the overall year, not just one check-in in December, you know, it would be like every quarter really look, what have I done? Am I doing what I want to do? Do I need to adjust any for the future? Yeah, I, yes, to all of it. I can relate to that so much. And I feel like I'm in that right now. Like, Ooh, what are you doing? Yeah. You have, you haven't yes. been showing up for yourself lately. And I think, you know, it can be, you can use any excuse under the book, like the engagement or the summertime, you want to have fun, yeah. your free time and this and that. But I also think you seem very similar personality to me wanting to give your absolute all and go above and beyond for your clients. So it's very easy to get excited about their projects and their yeah. things and their stuff, because I, I love it. Right. Like it's like a, it's like almost like its own sort of healthy addiction of, of loving you're, the, you're right. the client work that you do, but you're right. Like there are definitely things that I have noticed. Like, I feel like I'm less creative sometimes. Like I can't come up with new ideas because I have stopped doing that type of work for myself, which is very exciting Absolutely. to me. Even if I don't always get to the execution for myself in the time span that I want to sitting down and having those actual brainstorm sessions of where do I want to go next? Just like just breaks open this door of creativity that leads to everything else. So yes, I'm going to second that and <laughs> say, please, if that is you, let's make a commitment now to recognize that and not be hard on yourself. Like Arian said, not punish yourself, but recognize it and come up with a solution. Even if it's something small at first, like setting 20 minutes on a Monday morning to start your week off with you and treating yourself as your client. I think that that's very, very important. So thank you for sharing that with us. One thing I should say to that though, is like when I heard you explaining, like even right now for you, some of the like things that were you know, in your own life, maybe making it less easier for you to focus on your business. The only thing I can say now, I started my business again, six years ago. In that time, I've had two children. I have homeschooled. Oh, I have a total of three children, but I have two I've homeschooled people throughout that. I have done products and courses and clients. And I just think we all also need to be able to look at our goals from a even month to month basis, right? And yeah. be fair to ourselves. You know, I remember hold, like holding my baby while she was sleeping because she would only sleep on me, typing away for a client on my phone and thinking to myself like, and I did it for a while, but I thought to myself like, this is not the person I want to be. Like I want to enjoy the baby snuggles when they are baby snuggles. I want to work because I like it but I think I overloaded myself in certain situations. So just look at those, those fun things in life, like, you know, being engaged and planning a wedding, like that's, yes, that will take some time away from business and that's okay. Yeah. As like, as long as we are like focusing on this on and off, right? Like if it, if you do need to pull back at a certain point in time, give yourself the permission to do that and don't beat yourself up. Just know that let's say maybe after the summer, if that's a slower time for you, Maybe that's when you say, okay, September comes around and I am really going to set some goals. I'm going to put every, like five hours on that Monday is just right. for me. So right. just don't beat yourself up about it and just enjoy yes. those other things too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for everything you've shared with us today. I find that super, super value. Whenever I talk to somebody who kind of understands the in and outs of S and O. I feel like they bring something just slightly different to the table. And I really do appreciate everything you shared with us today. So tell us where we can find more of you and where we can come check out everything that you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Erin Olilla and my website is erinolilla.com. I know that is a mouthful. It's O-L-L-I-L-A. Um, on both places, you know, on Instagram, I really like to get to know people. So don't hesitate to send me a message. I spend more of my time on Instagram um, talking and less time marketing. And when it comes to um, our my website, I have a ton of resources on there and they can find me on my podcast as well, which is called Talk Copy to Me. Love it. Thank you so much, Erin. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you.